Um, my name is Colleen Corey. I'm the Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th Annual Frank M. Coffin Lecture on Law and Public Service. This lecture has always been one of the high points of the academic year at the University of Maine School of Law. It is also a great honor, indeed, for me to have the opportunity to meet and to present to you our distinguished lecturer, Professor Kai R. Fellbloom, and to introduce you as well, although he is a man who needs no introduction, to Judge Frank M. Coffin, the distinguished jurist and public servant for whom this lecture is named. We are also pleased this evening to welcome the family members of Judge Coffin who are with us, Mrs. Ruth Coffin, Judge Coffin's wife, And I'd also like to welcome the many of Judge Coffin's clerks, who as a group have been so instrumental in making this lecture series a reality. The University of Maine School of Law takes great pride in its sponsorship of the annual Coffin Lecture. The lecture reflects and celebrates the law school's strong and abiding commitment to public service and challenges us to consider new ways to ensure that law and the legal profession continue to serve the public good. The law school has a long record of public service to Maine, to New England, and the nation. The law school's faculty and students provide valuable public service through the Cumberland Legal Aid Clinic, which provides legal services to low-income Mainers, through the Marine Law Institute, the Garbrecht Law Library, the Technology Law Center, and through various student organizations, such as the Maine Association for Public Interest Law. Since its inception in 1992, the Coffin Lecture has brought to our community a brilliant array of extraordinarily talented and thoughtful individuals. From Ole and Michael Rao and the late Justice William J. Brennan, who delivered posthumously the remarks of our very first Coffin Lecturer, Joseph Rao, Jr., to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Alan Morrison, our most recent Coffin Lecturers. Each of the Coffin lecturers has challenged us to reflect in new ways upon the powerful intersection of law and public service. There is no doubt whatsoever that our 10th distinguished lecturer, Professor Chai Fellbloom, will continue in that fine tradition. It is hard to imagine a time in our national life when discussion and reflection of law and the rule of law and is more crucial, and when our commitment to public service is more essential. As Judge Coffin and I have divided our responsibilities year after year, I am to provide you with a biographical introduction of our lecturer, and Judge Coffin will, with his characteristic grace, provide the depth and substance. Kai Fellbloom has described herself as a pragmatist with passion. Both of these qualities, her pragmatism and her passion, are clearly evident in her writing, her teaching, and her career as a legislative lawyer. Now a professor of law and founding director of the Federal Legislation Clinic at Georgetown University Law Center, Professor Velblom did not set out to be a lawyer. As a youngster, she set her sights on becoming the first female Orthodox Talmudic scholar. <laughs> <laughs> she was drawn, she has said, to the intellectual challenge of focusing on the text, on seeing how each and every word has meaning. This is a challenge she has also found in the world of law and legislation, where she has worked to eradicate the injustices that foreclose opportunities for women, for people of color, for gays and lesbians, and for people with disabilities. Professor Fellbloom received her bachelor's degree summa cum laude from Barnard College in 1979. After working for several years in Washington, D.C., including service as a legislative assistant to then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski, Professor Fellbloom entered law school, graduating magna cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1985. After graduation, she served as a law clerk to our very own Judge Frank M. Coffin, and then as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. After her Supreme Court clerkship, Professor Fellbloom served as director of the legal research at the AIDS Action Council in Washington, D.C. In 1988, she moved to the American Civil Liberties Union, where as legislative counsel, she helped 
she served as lead lawyer responsible for drafting and negotiating the Americans with Disabilities Act. Professor Feldblum joined the Georgetown Law Faculty in 1991. Several years later, she established the Federal Legislation Clinic, which she continues to direct. Her clinic is the only clinic in the nation that focuses on federal legislation and provides students with opportunities to work with congressional legislators on behalf of disadvantaged groups. Right now, in fact today, she and her students are working on comments to proposed uh, changes in the Medicaid regulations and on voting rights issues affecting citizens with disabilities. Professor Feldblum is also engaged in both scholarship and activism in seeking to advance the rights of gays and lesbians. She has served as legal counsel to the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force since 1998 and has taken the lead in drafting and promoting the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which would establish employment protection for individuals discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation. Professor Feldblum continues to serve as president of the Disability Rights Council, a position that she has held since 1993. This provides a summary of some of Professor Feldblum's many accomplishments. The real introduction, the one that enlightens and deepens our understanding of her, will be given, as it always is, by another exemplar of a life devoted to law and public service, the individual for whom this lecture is named, Judge Frank M. Coffin. Judge Coffin is one of a rare breed of public servant. He has served with distinction in all three branches of government, as a United States Congressman, in the executive branch as Deputy Administrator of AID, the Agency for International Development, and then in the judiciary. First appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in 1965, he served as its Chief Judge from 1972 to 1983. In 1986, he assumed senior status on the court, but it hasn't slowed him down. In addition to hearing cases by assignment, he has continued to write books. He's now hard at work on his memoirs and to give generously of his time and prestige to ensure access to justice for all citizens. A graduate of Bates College and Harvard Law School, Judge Coffin is the author of four books and numerous articles. He holds honorary degrees from Bates, Colby, Bowdoin, and the University of Maine. Just last month, he was honored again, this time by his peers in the federal judiciary, with the most prestigious award a federal judge can receive, the Edward J. Devitt Distinguished Service to Justice Award, which was presented to him on September 10th by our eighth Coffin lecturer, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was chair of this, this year's selection committee. One of the great pleasures of my deanship has been the opportunity to work with Judge Coffin and to see this brilliant, funny, and gentle man in action. Those of you who have attended this event in the past may remember that it is a lecture filled with a long history of baseball metaphors. <laughs> a few years ago, at Judge Coffin's urging, I promised that I would cease and desist. But once again this year, baseball has generated another irresistible superlative. So I'm going to risk his ire and say, it is my great pleasure to present you someone who hits a home run every time he is at bat, the very bonds of the federal <laughs> judiciary, but with a much better personality, the Honorable Frank M. Coffin. Well, uh, Dean Corey and friends of the Coffin Lecture, uh, that was really a low blow at the end. I, th <laughs> I, th I thought we had uh, demolished this myth that I didn't know anything about baseball. And, you know, Harry Bonds is, you know, I, <laughs> I, he's great. But, <clears throat> but in preparation for this, I, I did some research and uh, in a book I'll tell you about, but the, the player I want to celebrate today is John Montgomery Ward. You don't know. I'm sure the dean, for all of her supposed scholarship, doesn't know. <laughs> but John Montgomery Ward was a Columbia Law student in the 
sixties, eighteen sixties and seventies, and uh, he became. Uh, he was going to law school at nights while playing for the New York Giants in the daytime. And he became, first of all, a pitcher, and, the, and, and he, uh, he holds, still holds the record for 100 games won as a pitcher and 2,000 runs batted in as a batter. And this guy started the Players Association, which tried to uh, get the, uh, the first players' union, which ultimately failed. But uh, John Montgomery Ward is my idea of a, of a man. <laughs> if, if, uh, if, if, if only people cared about baseball. I mean, well, well, I do want to, I do, notwithstanding that defect, I do want to pay tribute to Dean Corey. I know of no uh, head of a major institution who gives more caring attention to an event like this, who has uh, paid attention to all the details and has uh, personally involved herself in taking care of our speaker and coordinating with Mrs. Coffin and me and just making sure everything went well together with her invaluable assistant, Beth. So we're, we're deeply appreciative. This, this kind of thing doesn't just run automatically. Well, tonight it is a source of great pride and ple pleasure to be involved in bringing to Maine, for the second time in 17 years, your speaker, who has given new meaning to the theme of this lecture series, Law and Public Service. As I've followed her career she, since she left my same chambers, I see a, well, actually, what did I contribute to her, you know? Uh, she came to Chambers, as I remember it, uh, and I've checked the records. Uh, it was a late application. Uh, <laughs> but, but she came, she saw, she conquered, because I think I offered her the position at the end of the interview, and so that's a very rare thing for me to do. But after her career, uh, I see a consistent theme evident even before she went to law school. Before she went to law school, she tried to reorganize public transit in Manhattan and to start block organizations in Harlem at age 20 and 21. That's what I had to deal with. <laughs> so she has always strived to make law better serve people. She has had the rare thrill of high achievement at a very early age, but has had the wisdom to realize that steadiness and focus are far more valuable than high profile. Chief Justice A.T. Vanderbilt of New Jersey said a long while ago, and you will remember his fame because he was chiefly responsible, I think, for Justice Brennan being called to the attention of the president to be appointed to the Supreme Court. But A.T. Vanderbilt said, reform in the law is not for the short-winded. And High is a very long-winded person. <laughs> she leaves me literally breathless. At, at age 30, shortly after leaving Justice Blackmun's chambers, High found herself in the grip of a seismic movement in removing barriers in disability law. A multitude of interests had come together. High, then working as legislative counsel for the ACLU, found herself as lead counsel for 120 organizations. She and Pat Wright, executive director of the Disability Rights Educational Defense Fund led the fight which finally culminated in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in July of 1990. This was a major achievement since the Bush administration and both houses of Congress had to be brought together in a historic legislative act. High and Mrs. Wright, Ms. Wright were given a rare though ill-intended tribute by the National Review, which was thoroughly disgusted by the whole affair. 
In a scathing article, the review charged Feldblum and Wright not only with helping write the bill, but calling most of the shots throughout the legislative process. According to a disaffected New Hampshire congressman, High and Pat controlled the votes on the Judiciary Committee. And in the eyes of the National Review, most unforgivable was the deference shown to them by the Republican White House, which would refer amendments to them, have them looked over for approval by the two chieftains, and then receive back, and I quote, a package of amendments the White House was permitted to support. <laughs> now, the picture of two young women standing like colossi bestride a cowering Congress and a craven White House <laughs> is surely without rival with the possible exception of the power wielded over the nobles and dauphin of France by the Maid of Orleans. <laughs> O overblown by, though it was, and not the kind of publicity one welcomes, the, the criticism was a veiled tribute to a most effective job. But High, seeking a change from such a fast lane, took a leave of absence to serve as visiting professor at Georgetown. Here she found her academic base, and though tempted to join the Clinton administration, what sold her on staying permanently at Georgetown was a, a serendipitous event, her creation of the Federal Legislation Clinic, the only one in the country, consisting of two fellows, each supervising six students. The clinic serves two to four charitable or public interest organizations each year, working on legislation in such areas as welfare reform, family violence, medical privacy, mental health and criminal justice, and AIDS funding. The students gain experience in research, writing, editing, presentation, developing strategies, forming coalitions, and negotiating with congressional staffs, administrative agencies, and advocacy groups. The clinic, in the words of former Associate Dean Peter Byrne, is one of the most respected and sought after learning opportunities in the nation. The focus of High's efforts is to train what she has called the legislative lawyer. The need for this new type of legislative lawyer has dramatically increased as the task of legislative <coughs> drafting has become fractionated. When I was in Congress, once the preserve of the Legislative Council of House and Senate and of Committee Staff Council was supreme, you never went outside of them. Now legislative drafting has jumped the fence. Increased turnover of committee staff and consequent erosion of institutional memory, new kinds of legislation such as the massive omnibus End of, uh, end of session major reconciliation bill where last minute substantive additions can be hidden in the global package. Individual members who view themselves not particularly as member of a party or of a committee, but in the words of one observer, as entrepreneurs in a vast open marketplace at the service of interest groups and the lobbyist who just happens to have a draft in my pocket have all conspired to change the ground rules. To the legislative lawyer who would work in this maelstrom, High brings her own approach. In the words of Dean Byrne, as a good advocate, High understands the difference between a principle and practice, embracing compromise as the meeting ground of people of goodwill with different needs and outlooks. She calls herself, as Dean Corey remarked, a pragmatist with passion. She expands the possibilities for agreement by the purity of her own motives and by her sincere embrace of the dignity of opponents. With one foot in the academy 
and the other in not only working on significant legislation, but developing a new breed of lawyer, Professor Feldblum comes to us, unlike all previous Coffin lecturers, in mid-career, but already with a unique record of melding a life in law with a life in public service. I am deeply honored to present the 10th Coffin Lecturer, Professor Hai Feldrum. Happy at the Judiciary Committee markup when, you know, every time there was an amendment, they'd say, oh, well, well, we have to check it out first, you know, and like, there we were in the back room. So yeah, it did sort of annoy some people. But I can assure you, no one was cowed in, you know, in the White House or Congress. It was all about doing that work Right, day by day, piece by piece, and uh, when we ran a motto clinic for the a motto for the federal legislation clinic, a motto contest for the clinic, um, a few years ago, the motto that won was changing the world one word at a time. Okay, <laughs> because the point about a legislative lawyer is someone who can live in politics, but understand the law thoroughly so they can develop the most creative language that both gets the votes you need so the bill becomes a law and doesn't say just a bill, but also gets your client as much as the client can achieve in that political process. Okay, but I have to say it is an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. It's both an honor and a joy to deliver this lecture. I've often felt that there are two defining qualities in sort of making a life worth living. Um, passion and connection. I guess you've gotten that already, the passion part. <laughs> to me, I experience a passion in my work, my desire to make the world a better place. You know, it's not just a corny statement, it's a, you know, a real feeling. Desire in my work, des uh, passion in my teaching, desire to pass on to others whatever wisdom or skills I've accumulated and passion in my home life, a desire to commit to the joys and challenges of intimacy. And the connections I treasure track those passions, starting from the connection one gets from one's intimate partner, friends, colleagues, students, and mentors. For me, Judge Frank Maury Coffin is a remarkable and joyous connection in my life. And it's the connection of a mentor and a teacher and a friend. And in the example of his life, Judge Coffin has demonstrated his passion for making the world a better place, his passion for imparting wisdom and jibes and practical jokes, which he just did on me last night again, I just have to say, and I'm so gullible that it worked. Okay, <laughs> he's not allowed to tell you what it was. And his passion for maintaining a full and happy home life. I have been enriched by my connection with Judge Coffin, enriched both with the little pearls of wisdom and the great peals of laughter, and I am everlastingly grateful for those riches. So I can think of no finer way to honor that connection and to repay some of the gifts that Judge Coffin has showered on me than to deliver this lecture tonight that connects so many of the passions of my life. And on the occasion of this 10th, annual Coffin Lecture. I feel as if I stand as a representative of every former and current law clerk of the judge whom I know would express the same gratitude and joy at their connection with the judge. Okay, so to the lecture. Now, first, let me say, and you sort of heard this, that I spend most of my time as a doer. Right? I do things. <laughs> in the clinic, I do a lot of welfare work, poverty work, violence, disability rights. And in my consultant job, I do a lot of gay rights. And everything I'm going to talk about tonight stems from my personal experiences in these different arenas. But because I'm a professor, I also have the joy and the challenge of embarking on scholarly enterprises. It, it's a joy when I have time and a challenge when I don't. That's that thing about having the feet in both worlds. But for purposes of this lecture, I want to note that being a scholar, as opposed to a doer, as an advocate in the field, in either litigation or legislation, means two things. Number one, I don't come here with a definite endpoint in mind. 
I come to, an, to the endeavor with values. But unlike when I have a client, when I have a client, we know where we're getting to. And if there are any sticky points along the way, legal sticking points, the goal is to how to get around them. Okay, not to say, oh my God, that's a sticky point. Maybe we shouldn't have this goal. Okay, clients don't like that, right? <laughs> I mean, the point about in, in litigation is each party is doing that, and then the judge is the impartial third party that decides, okay, you know, resolving the sticky points in a way that's impartial. If you're in the legislature, the members of Congress are not impartial judges. They're basically aligned with the advocates. But in negotiations, the sticky points come out. And again, you don't say, oh my god, good point. You know, Maybe we shouldn't be pushing this bill. Right? You say, oh, OK, sticky point. How about if we write it this way? OK, but when you're a lawyer for a client, that end goal is in place. When you're approaching an issue as a scholar, there is no client. The goal is simply to figure out what makes sense. And two, something that flows from that is, in scholarship, you don't have to have the full answer. Okay, it's not a good idea to say, in litigation or legislation, God, that's a tough issue. I can see both sides. Yeah, I don't know what I think. Cl clients do not appreciate that type of, you know, candor. Right? I mean, the judge has to make a decision. The legislator has to vote one way or the other. You better have the answer, even if you don't have the answer. Right? Scholarship is different. You can say, you know what, that's a tough issue. There are various sides. This is what I think about it so far. Okay, so for me tonight, a successful talk is not one where all of you leave and you're convinced to my end point. Right? To me, I hope that when you leave, you've heard a few new interesting ideas that can inform your thinking and conclusions, and maybe as you talk and your questions will then inform mine. There's not a client other than all of us that care about law and public service and justice. Okay, so to the topic at hand. Well, you've got my punchline from the title, okay? Punchline is that I believe that a legal mandate that requires businesses and employers to make reasonable accommodations is a form of equality, not equality plus. And this mandate exists in Title VII for religion and in the ADA for disability. Now, here are three snippets from my doings, okay, that I'm gonna use to get started on this conversation with you. First snippet. I wrote an amicus brief for members of Congress in the case, University of Alabama versus Garrett, which was an ADA case that the Supreme Court heard last year. Now, I am not a litigator, okay? I'm, I'm working legislation, but um, I often say I don't have kids, I have laws, okay? So I have one of them that's 11 years old. She's hanging out in the Supreme Court way too often for my taste. Okay, that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I have the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which has been in utero since 1993, so, you know, there are some minuses when it's a law, not a kid, you know. Um, so, you know, even though I don't do litigation, one, you know, once your kid is out there, uh, you know, it's like kids, you know, if you could just keep them home all the time, have no other influences on them, they'd be just perfect, right? They go out, they, they have peers, they have teachers, right? Well, laws have judges, and they're not always as good as Judge Coffin. So, you know, it's like, Sometimes you gotta, it's like you gotta get out there to sort of help your kid along. And that's, every amicus brief I've written in ADA has sort of been in that genre. Let me tell you what I think about this law. Um, so in the Garrett case, the question was whether Congress, when it passed the ADA, was acting to enforce the constitutional guarantee that says that no state can deny to its people the equal protection of the law. So that was the question in the case. Basically, was the ADA the type of law that essentially enforces equality? Okay, so I'm reading cases that have talked about this, and Judge Easterbrook from the Seventh Circuit, it's no problem with the answer. No, <laughs> absolutely not. And here's his reasoning. He says, look, it's rational for a university to want to hire a sighted person instead of a blind person. Right? The sighted person can master more materials because reading is faster than listening. And it's also less expensive to hire a sighted person because you don't have to also hire a reader to read the stuff. So, and here's Judge Easterbrook, quote, an academic institution that prefers to use its given budget to hire a sighted scholar plus a graduate teaching assistant rather than a blind scholar plus a reader 
has complied with its constitutional obligation to avoid irrational action. But it has not complied with the ADA, which requires accommodation at any cost less than undue hardship. Now, just to translate that reasoning a little bit, so what he's saying is the federal constitution prohibits only irrational discrimination against people with disabilities. In other words, discrimination that comes out of prejudice, out of malice, right? completely irrational discrimination. That's what equal protection means for people with disabilities. But the ADA goes beyond mandating equality because, for example, he says this school would have, found, would have been found to have violated the ADA if it didn't hire the blind professor solely on the grounds that the professor needed a reader. Right? So under this theory, a mandate to provide reasonable accommodation is clearly creating an equality plus situation, not just equality. And that's why Congress wasn't acting to enforce the Equal Protection Clause when it passed ADA. Snippet number one. Snippet number two. For two years, I worked to try to amend a bill called the Religious Liberty Protection Act that was going through Congress, um, tried to amend it so that civil rights laws were exempted from the scope of that bill. And what that bill did was give people a religious defense against neutral state laws. Okay, so if a state law infringed on their religious beliefs or practices, they could say, wait a second, you can't do that because it infringes on my religious beliefs. And what I and the people I was working with wanted was to carve out civil rights laws from that bill. So a person couldn't raise a religious defense against a civil rights bill. Now, as you will hear in my talk, I believe that mandating reasonable accommodations for religious people is an essential form of equality. So how do I square that with my position on wanting an exemption for civil rights laws? Because right? I was therefore taking away what would otherwise be an accommodation to their religious beliefs. Okay, snippet number two. Last snippet. I'm in The Hague about four years ago. They're having a meeting about uh, developing a new European code of justice. And I'm there to give the, you know, the United States take on disability. And one of the comments I remember most clearly was someone said, you know, we have protection, protection for people based on sexual orientation already in, in this law. That really hasn't been a problem. But any time we raise disability, they tell us that's special rights, and they don't want to put that in. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. Fascinating. All through the passage of the ADA, no one ever raised special rights as a flag. I mean, it's coming up now, right, in the context of saying ADA is more than simple equality. As opposed to the gay rights bill, special rights is the main flag that people bring out. So to me, the question is, are some or are all civil rights laws really about special rights? And if so, is special rights different from equality? Okay, so my three snippets, disability, religion, sexual orientation. Well, I think to think about these questions, we need to know the story of how reasonable accommodation mandates got into the law with regard to religion and got into the law with regard to disability and why, as you'll see, reasonable accommodation appears nowhere in gay rights bills. Okay, so this, we have to know the story of how that happened and that's basically a story about law and politics. There's like almost no conceptual thinking going on, you know, that's sort of messy for Congress. I like to just like pass stuff. Okay, so I'm going to do the story first of the law and politics. Okay, that's like the ingredients for the cake. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to do the conceptual overlay. Okay, the icing that sort of doesn't happen as you go. That's, you know, as an advocate, you just want the end goal. There's no reason to come back and put icing on the cake. Right, as a scholar, you actually do, because sometimes you might discover this isn't just icing, this is like marble all the way through. I just came up with that metaphor. I don't know if it works, but anyway. Okay, I had the cake stuff in here. I'm just not sure about the moment. Okay. So the story begins in the early 1960s, right? It's a time of intense civil rights struggle. Congress finally breaking the stranglehold of the conserv conservative Southern Democrats passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And Title VII of that act says that private employers cannot discriminate based on race, color, national origin, religion, and sex. Now, there's almost no discussion, and I've been looking and I'm going to look again, but the 
so far, I have found like very little discussion about what non-discrimination based on religion means. I mean, there was a lot of stuff, obviously, this was generated by the struggle for African Americans, and that was what most of the discussion was about. Okay, but gets passed in the law. Okay, now imagine you guys are all lawyers working for the newly formed Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Of course, EEOC would have been lucky to have these many lawyers. <laughs> they probably had like six. Um, but imagine you guys are all lawyers, you're 1965, this law has passed, and now you're supposed to issue regulations to implement this non-discrimination mandate. Well, it's pretty clear what that means for race, right? You're going to write regulations that say, you've got to just ignore race. You, have to, you cannot take race into account. That's how you implement the non-discrimination mandate. But what about religion? Okay, is that, does it truly implement the non-discrimination mandate to say that you should ignore religion and never take it into account? I mean, that'll work fine for some employer that still has a rule that says no Jews or Muslims need apply. And obviously you say, excuse me, you can't take religion into account. But what if you have an employer that has a rule that says um, all employees have to work on Saturday and Sunday every few weeks, and also I have mandatory overtime rules, so if I need you in here on a Saturday or Sunday, you've got to show up. And then you've got someone who's an Orthodox Jew or a Seventh-day Adventist that says, I, it's against my religion to work Friday night to, su to Saturday night. So is it non-discrimination to say just ignore the religion, don't take it into account? It's not going to help that person. In fact, they're coming forward and saying that discrimination is the fact that you aren't taking it into account, you know, and not letting me get out of that requirement. So EOC lawyers had to say what they think. That's the point of, like, you sometimes have to have an answer, even if you're not sure what it should be. And in fact, the EEOC sort of muddled its way through to an answer. In June 1966, they issued a guidance that said, now, can't discriminate because of religion means that you have to try to reasonably accommodate a person who wants to take off his or her Sabbath as long as you can make that accommodation without serious inconvenience to your business. But if you set up an expected work week, and with like mandated overtime, and a religious person knows beforehand about that schedule when he or she applies for the job, then you don't have to accommodate the person. That's what they said in June 1966. Well, a year later, in June 1967, they came back with some more guidance, and they said, actually, you do need to make an accommodation to an established work schedule, even if the person knew about it before, but you don't have to make any accommodation that would impose an undue hardship on your business. But otherwise, it's a form of non-discrimination to make these changes, exemptions, in your work schedule. Meanwhile, this guy named Mr. Dewey, couldn't find his first name, but anyway, Mr. Dewey, is a member of the Faith Reformed Church, which apparently believes that it is a sin to work on Sunday. Okay, so this wasn't a problem of Saturday versus Sunday. This is his church did not believe that one should work on Sunday. His employer, Reynolds Metal Company, had negotiated a collective bargaining agreement that required that employees be available for mandatory overtime, including on Sunday. Dewey says, I'd like to be exempted from this. The employer says, no. Dewey doesn't show up on a Sunday, and Dewey gets fired. And then Dewey sues, because that's what America's about. No, because <laughs> that was the other thing they told me at The Hague. God, you people in America, you sue all the time. I was like, we're a justice people. Okay, but anyway, he sues under Title VII, and he loses. Right? The appeals court for the Sixth Circuit says, sorry, guy, Title VII only prohibits non-discrimination based on religion. And what you're asking for is special treatment based on religion. Right? Here's the court's explanation. really sort of captures it. They go, the fundamental error of Dewey and his amici, because apparently like all the Jewish and Christian <laughs> groups had put in amicus briefs on this. The fundamental error of Dewey and his amici is that they equate religious discrimination with failure to accommodate. We submit these two concepts are entirely different. The employer ought not to be forced to accommodate each of the varying religious beliefs and practices of his employees. Or as they said at another point, the simple answer to all of Dewey's claims is that the collective bargaining agreement 
was equal in its application to all employees and uniformly applied, discriminating against no one. Pretty clear, right? Case goes up to the Supreme Court. The court divides four to four. In a per curiam opinion, they just affirm, I mean, they, they, if the case is affirmed by an equally divided court. In other words, there's no opinion by the Supreme Court, but the lower court opinion stands. And that's in June 1971. Okay, well, you can imagine some of the religious groups were not too happy. You know, all the ones that had written those amicus briefs <laughs> that had been blown away. Well, what you do when you're blown away by the courts is you go to the legislature and say, could you fix this? And that's what they did. Well, there was a bill going through Congress at that point called the Equal Employment Opportunity Enforcement Act of 1971. And most of the bill was all about giving the EEOC enforcement power. There was nothing about religion. January 1972, the bill is on the Senate floor, and Senator Randolph gets up and says, I've got an amendment, and I sure hope the manager of the, this bill likes this amendment. He says he's got an amendment which he puts into the definition section of Title VII, and he says the term religion includes all aspects of religious observance and practice, as well as belief, unless an employer demonstrates that he's unable to reasonably accommodate to an employee or prospective employee's religious observance or practice without undue hardship on the conduct of his business. Okay, he stuffs all this into the definition of religion. It's basically a new substantive provision of what it means not to discriminate. It means you've got to provide a reasonable accommodation unless it would be an undue hardship. And Senator Randolph says, look, I'm a member of a small denomination called the Seventh-day Baptists. He says, we're smaller than the Seventh-day Adventists, also smaller than the number of Orthodox Jews, but all of us share the piece of we don't work from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. And he says, I thought this was a fascinating sort of disclosure, he says, we are really having problems with our young folks because they're finding it hard to keep the religion because the work schedule is just not accommodating them. So I think this is a good amendment. And Senator Williams, who's the manager of the bill, says, okay, well, I have sort of a question. What if an employer has a job that the job is only on Saturday and Sunday? It's like a, at a resort. And the person just says, I want to work one day. You know, would that be an undue hardship? Senator Randolph says, yeah, that would be an undue hardship. I mean, not a tough question. That was the one, like, substantive conversation. And then Williams says, sounds like a good amendment to me. They have a roll call vote 55 to 0, because the other 45 people aren't there. You know, really, it's like, now, no conversation, right, about is this equality or equality plus? You know, is this discrimination because you're giving special treatment to the religious person? No, it was just, you know, it's not fair to be punished for having a different religious belief, and we should change it, and let's move on. And that's what they did, went into the law. Two years later, 1973, Congress passes the Rehabilitation Act, which includes a section in the miscellaneous section called Section 504 that says any program or entity that gets federal funds cannot discriminate against an otherwise qualified person with a handicap. Now again, Congress's usual fashion, they don't describe and explain what this non-discrimination means, but now all you guys have now become attorneys for the Department of Health, Education, and Labor, which has to issue regulations, but you're doing better than you did a few years ago because you've got the basis of the EEOC regulation on religion, and so you put in your regulations that non-discrimination based on disability includes a requirement to make reasonable accommodations as long as they don't impose an undue hardship. And you give some more examples of it because in religion it was mostly work schedules, but in disability you explain that means creating physical access for someone who uses a wheelchair, it means a sign language interpreter for someone who's deaf. It means changing a work schedule for someone who needs that. All these are affirmative obligations on the part of the business that the business has to make as a form of non-discrimination unless it would impose an undue hardship. Now, we sort of have this problem that in 1977, the Supreme Court gets a religious accommodation case and it decides that undue hardship in Title VII for religion means anything that's more de minimis. Anything that's more than de minimis is going to be an undue hardship. Okay, I'll let you in on a secret. If you want to make sure that someone doesn't have to do too much in the law, 
you say anything more than de minimis is something you don't have to do. Okay, so I am sure that Senator Randolph did not have that idea of undue hardship, but there was no effort in Congress at that point to change the definition of undue hardship. But for us, 10 years later, when we came to drafting the Americans with Disabilities Act, we were very aware of this decision. And so we did three things. We put the requirement of reasonable accommodation into the statute, okay, so no one could say this isn't a form of non-discrimination. We gave a definition of undue hardship, significant difficulty or expense, and just in case that wasn't clear enough, in the legislative history we said, this is not the same standard that exists under Title VII for religion. This is a higher standard. Now, you could well ask, what's the conceptual basis for treating people with disabilities better than religious people? The fact is, there is none. And basically, what we figured is, that's the wrong standard for religion as well. I mean, why should we repeat the mistake? Let's get the right, what we think is the right standard, significant difficulty or expense, and maybe at some point Congress will follow and fix Title VII. And in fact, there is a bill that's been pending for a number of years now to amend the definition of undue hardship in Title VII to make it the same as ADA, but it has not moved. And part of the issue has been that the religious community has been focusing its efforts elsewhere, and this is the the last piece of the story in terms of reasonable accommodation. There's a long story here about this little song and dance between Congress and the court about religious freedom, of which I will mercifully skip the first two-thirds of it and just go to the last piece, which is when Congress was considering this Religious Liberty Protection Act. And the point about the Religious Liberty Protection Act was to say that despite what the Supreme Court had said the Constitution under the First Amendment required, this was Congress saying that any time that there was a neutral state law that impacted on a religious belief or practice, that that government that passed the law, be it a locality, a city, a state, the federal government, whatever government had passed that law that had that effect, of infringing religious belief or practice had to defend that law as narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest. And if the government couldn't meet that high standard, then the religious person gets essentially an automatic exemption from that law. Now, this is something that Congress had passed as part of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and at the time, nobody raised the fact how this might impact on gay civil rights law. But several years after that law passed, one started to see cases out there where landlords were saying, I don't want to rent to unmarried cohabiting heterosexuals, because that's against my religious belief to basically be enabling them in their sinful activity. And there were a number of state laws that said you can't discriminate based on marital status in housing. Now, during some of this time, this original Religious Freedom Restoration Act was in place, and some courts said, well, you know what? Prohibiting discrimination based on marital status and housing is a compelling government interest, and the only way to do this is not to have a huge exemption for anyone who has a religious belief, and the landlords lost. And some courts said, well, you know, I mean, prohibiting discrimination based on marital status is not as compelling a government interest as, like, eradicating race discrimination, and the landlords won. Okay, so when Congress started dealing with the Religious Liberty Protection Act, which would have set the same standard, the gay group said, we want an exemption from civil rights laws. We don't want anyone to be allowed to raise a religious defense against complying with a state gay rights law. Now, conceptually, the gay groups could have said, you know, that whole standard is problematic in terms of what's the correct policy for the country. But because politically, the groups did not want to harm the coalition to say, we think your whole bill is bad. Because, you know, coalitions, there were people in that coalition that were friends with the gay rights groups. So they said, no, no, your bill, it's lovely, it's beautiful, it's great, Congress should pass it, except we want a carve out for civil rights laws. But the defenders of the bill were like, we don't want to do that, because what's your rationale for a carve out for civil rights laws, as opposed to a carve out for child abuse laws or environmental laws? I mean, all these laws are important. We're just saying someone should have the right to raise a religious defense. 
Well, what they ended up doing politically was what was called a carve-in. They decided, they passed what we call Baby Rilpa. Baby Rilpa was the Land Use and Institutional Persons Religious Freedom Act. Okay, so it established this standard for land use and for prisons, which meant that they weren't saying that they wouldn't come back and do the other areas. Right? So there was no adverse inference on the fact that they couldn't have the standard for other areas. They were just starting with these two. Okay, last piece of the story. I do want to point out that even though there's baby Wilpa, that does not end the conflict between gay rights and religious beliefs. For example, a case that was decided just this year by the Fifth Circuit, this woman Sandra Brupp is hired as a mental health counselor by North Mississippi Health Services. This group has contracts with a bunch of employers throughout Mississippi to offer employee assistance programs, including counseling. And they have three EAP counselors, and each of those counselors will like, go to some location during particular days, and then the employees come and they do the counseling, okay, and then they go to other locations. Well, Sandra goes to one of these locations. This woman comes for counseling. Fine. A few months later, the woman comes for counseling again and says that she wants some help in dealing with issues in her relationship. You know, which would be, I think, probably a sort of run-of-the-mill EAP type of counseling session, except that this woman is a lesbian. And she wants help in dealing with the issues in her lesbian relationship. And Sandra says, I, I cannot see you. I, I can't counsel you because I think being in a lesbian relationship is sinful and I just, I mean, I can't enable you to be in this relationship. So poor Jane Doe leaves and um, clearly complains to her employer, who has this contract with North Mississippi Health Services, and North Mississippi says to Sandra, what's going on here? And Sandra says, look, I have religious beliefs and you need to accommodate me. In fact, not, I can't counsel a gay person and I also cannot and will not counsel someone who's in an unmarried, cohabiting, you know, heterosexual relationship because I think that's also sinful, sex before marriage. Okay, and so what do you want me to do? And she's like, I don't know, I just want to be able to have the right not to have to see these people. And the employer ends up saying, well, we can't do that. It would be an undue hardship to accommodate you. We only have three counselors. You know, we can't send two of them out just in case there's someone you can't counsel. And, you know, the employers think that they're getting full services. So uh, how many people, so the, the um, Fifth Circuit, um, rules in favor of the employer against Sandra. How many people here think that Sandra lost below at the trial, you know, in her jury trial? How many people think here think Sandra lost at her jury trial? Raise your hands high. Okay, we've got one person. Does that mean, how many people here think Sandra won at her jury trial? Raise your hands high. Okay. How many people are not sure? They're just not sure. Okay, good, I knew there was another option. Um, well, actually, she won. She won at the jury trial. The jury, in fact, gave her $32,000 in back pay, $320,000 in compensatory damages, and $1.7 million in punitive damages. Now, that was all reduced to the 300,000 cap that exists on damages, but then overturned by the Fifth Circuit. So, Sandra has to get another job because of her religious beliefs. Now, is that fair, right? I mean, would it have been fair to do what she wanted? It means her coworkers might have to travel with her, or if not, they have to travel back afterwards. You know, and what about for the employee who has to deal with something of the humiliation of being told, I can't counsel you? Um, so there's a conflict of rights here. And while I personally don't believe that gay sexual relationships or sex before marriage is sinful, I do accept that for many people it is sinful. So I don't think it's a conflict of rights that we can just sort of dismiss on the fact that, you know, she shouldn't have this belief. It's not about should. She has this belief as a matter of her sincerely held religion. So what do we do in terms of this conflict? All right, the final piece of the story for the icing. Um, is one of the groups that still experience job discrimination, gay men, lesbians, bisexual people, and transgendered people, still don't have a federal law 
giving them even non-discrimination, right? Like I said, that's the one that's in, been in utero, 1993, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. But that bill explicitly says that its non-discrimination mandate does not encompass a requirement that employers provide health benefits or other benefits to the domestic partners of their gay employees. So it's a bill that has a non-discrimination mandate, but an explicit carve-out for domestic partner benefits. Okay, now I want to go back and unpack some of the concepts under this political and legal story. That is, I want to show you why I think mandating reasonable accommodation is part and parcel of legislating equality, not equality plus, and the implications of that concept for resolving conflicts between rights of equality. And I want to also use it to explain why I think all gay rights laws we have right now, including the one I helped draft, are deficient in a basic respect. Right, let me start by saying that I think when a legislature passes a non-discrimination law, it does it in order to achieve a state of equality for the people covered under the law. Now, if equality means treating people equally, treating people the same, then a law that also mandates reasonable accommodations for religion or disability or sexual orientation is not a law that mandates equality. It's the exact opposite. I mean, it's mandating differential treatment. Okay, so if law means treating people equally, then a law that mandates reasonable accommodation is not a law that achieves equality. But if equality means treating persons as an equal, if equality means treating another person as an equal in society, then a law that mandates these types of reasonable accommodations is absolutely a law that establishes and creates equality. Why? Society is set up with certain norms, right? I mean, in the area of religion, the norm is that the Sabbath is Sunday, not Saturday. There's also a norm that you can be a Christian and be able to still work on Sunday. It's sort of like another norm within religion. We have norms in our physical space, in our structural arrangements, right? Buildings are built with steps. We all grow up learning English, or maybe some other language in our household, but we don't all grow up learning sign language at the same time. We often use the printed word on paper to convey our thoughts. Right? That's just how we operate. The norm in the benefits area is that married people get benefits and that the government can do things, rights and responsibilities within marriage. These norms have all been created by affirmative actions and decisions taken by all of us collectively as a society over time. Now, these actions and decisions, you know, they're essentially taken for granted because they sort of arise from the facts on the ground, you know, from the majority. To me, a key thing is that these actions and decisions are not taken 